All right, we're talking about The Poacher by Ursula K. Le Guin. I got it from Bedtime Stories. I, I think it's in one of her collections too. Which one did you read? Uh, I did it on the Kindle as well. The one you sent me, the Unreal Real version. Really, yeah. really, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so when it comes to the story, I guess let's do a quick plot recap and then we'll jump into kind of some of the discussion because I, I don't think there, there's a lot of words, but there's not a lot of happenings, I guess, in the story in some regards. Low on the action. Yes. We start out as a poor boy and he's kind of like a hunter for his family, frequently looking for mushrooms. His father was abusive and would beat him and his mother uh, just so that he would feel better than someone. And one step day mother. while expl- stepmother, sorry, sorry. That makes it super fairy tale when it's a stepmother. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be the evil, but she's not an evil stepmother. She's just a stepmother. <laughs> she's actually an okay stepmother for once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. One day while exploring, the boy comes across a tall hedge of brambles and he wonders what's on the other side. So he goes through this journey of looking for whetstones, things to sharpen blades, and he works at it. He continually cuts at these brambles until he gets to the other side and finds a castle of all things. And on these grounds, this is when it should start clicking or feeling familiar. Everybody's asleep. The cows, the guards, the porters, the chefs, everybody. Um, even though the stuff's still happening, it's, it's, it's an enchanted land is, is kind of what you get. Mm-hmm. So boy, I'll say he goes here and enjoys. I'm just going to use the word niceties of the yeah, he area. He ransacks the village, sort of. He, he, <laughs> he, he certainly indulges. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit here. Uh, but make sure not to wake the sleeping woman in the castle because she is the center of the enchantment. And he continues to come here until he's much older. Uh, for a very, very long time when the, when the prince should come to, to wake her up and story. So in terms of a discussion, I think it's not a shocker to anyone that, yes, this is the Sleeping Beauty universe, if you will. It's an interesting kind of take of, I guess, a third party or observer of this. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the huge buildup because I feel like the story had a lot at the beginning to get us into the castle and I thought that maybe he was going to be the prince and it's just he's some dude that stumble upon the bramble bushes and uh, has to hack away at them. Um, I guess it's built around in a circle like a moat, uh, but there is a moat as well. So there's the moat and the bramble bushes and they're supposed to be magical. And he, you know, hacks through them to get in there and uh, doesn't doesn't want to save anybody. Uh, he just wants to kind of ransack the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the um, the Disney cartoon, Maleficent put the thorn brambles around the castle to keep Prince Philip out, right? So it was an enchantment from oh. her to keep external people from coming in, to keep Philip out, right? Like, she didn't want to break the spell. Um, but but I guess that brings us to the larger discussion of this is an old fairy tale. It didn't start with Disney. We're talking 1300 through 1697, somewhere around there all this started. And there's a lot of different versions, right? You have versions where there's seven fairies and then one of the fairies was excluded. So she cast the evil spell and there's somewhere, you know, it's not necessarily a thimble, but it could be another thing. But, you know, the parents are trying to protect the child but still an evil spell comes along because they were excluded for something. So there's something to be said about protection, about from the parent trying to keep the child safe from the outside world. Okay. Coming of age discussion here as well as exclusion, right? Because you have the seven fairies excluding one of the fairies, even in the Disney one, Uh, they talk about how all you invited the rabble. And then there's like the reimagining from the Maleficent point of view, the Angela Angelina Jolie movie. The story is definitely set in a realm of realism. And one thing that struck me odd that was not put in there was the fact that there's no really religious overtone or undertone at all. I'm feeling that during the time period that a lot of these fairy tales were created or based on the time period religion is a heavy element in these people's lives and that they're using magic and unknown things unexplainable things because they don't have science to explain their worlds and in this case of this story there isn't really any religion uh, reference specifically that i could find it's just set in a very real world in a very primitive world where this boy is living this really rough life and finds some type of escapism. And that's one thing that I felt a lot of was too, was to escape his reality. 
and he comes into this dream world. Uh, see what I did there? And <laughs> he he's trying to get away from this tortured life that he has of his, you know, father, you know, taking out his transgressions on him. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because you have in the original fairy tales, you have uh, the original king of, you know, Princess Aurora from Disney and such. He wanted to protect her from the evils of the world, the spindle that would curse her with this prophecy, if you will. So you have a parent trying to protect a child from the coming of age and and whisks her away to the country for her to be safe, right? But in this story, it's the opposite, where I, do we, I think we take these as poorer people, right? They're not nobles. They don't own the woods. They, they're poaching in the woods in the same way that everybody kind of poaches in a sense. But he's not safe, right? Like he doesn't have the safety of the family the way that the princess or the nobles allegedly do. He's abused by his father. And when his mother tries to protect him, she's abused and he doesn't even feel all that bad. He almost is like starting to feel like, okay, well, at least it's not me. At least I can feel a little bit better about myself because I'm not the one that's being abused this time. He he has no safety in his neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah, he has kind of a broken life I and mean, he has no sympathy. Uh, I love the little pun there in the woods. And you definitely get this sense that he'll do whatever it takes. And that's been kind of bred into him. He goes and steals from the old man to get the whetstone to sharpen his, you know, uh, uh, axe or knives to, you know, cut through the magical bramble bush. He he's eventually thinks about stealing from other people as well. Uh, and this whole endeavor takes him a couple of years. So this isn't something that is just, I think, a childhood fantasy. This is something that he is determined to, you know, accomplish and get through. So it gives him a goal in life, I think, again, that allows him to escape his, his other life. He gets really good at catching rabbits so that he can dedicate a lot of his life to this. He, he specializes in this becoming his his goal, his mission. And the, the whole story, I feel like, also revolves around control. His father had control over his family, so now he's trying to find a way to have control over his own life. The, the, the bushes put in there by Maleficent or whoever controls the princess in their lives. And then when he gets in there, he can finally enact his own will upon these unbeknownst people who are all asleep. And there is a few parts that are kind of really grim and dark. If, if you know, you read between the lines of what this poor boy uh, or not so poor boy eventually does once he becomes the man in control. Is is enchantment a metaphor, a phrase for that when you have power, such as in the opening, we have the nobles who can do what they want with the land. You have the father who's stronger than everyone else until the boy becomes strong enough that he can't pick on him anymore. Is enchantment the power that we have that allows us to inflict our will upon others from like a ubermensch Friedrich Nietzsche perspective of if I have the will and power to do it, then that's what makes it right. Probably that's what it's supposed to be. I think it's more of an excuse and shows the the wickedness of when one is taught wrong, they will continue to do wrong. And the boy is taught wrong and he sees the things that he goes into the 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 sleeping castle and kind of takes advantage of these people and he sees it as okay because he has been done wrong he's lived poor and nobody helped him out so now he's going to take advantage of the situation where he goes and gets the food and reads the books and there might be a you know uh some type of part where he takes advantage of a woman uh that that's asleep it's it's very telling of how we pass on those traits to the younger generations so where, where, where do you, how do you explain the title then, The Poacher? This obviously could be very straightforward to the fact that he is poaching the animals, the rabbits and things. I think it also, he mentions too that everybody does it, so it makes it okay. It's that justification that, well, if I'm poaching and everybody's poaching, it's okay to be a poacher. But I also feel that it comes down to the core of that he is taking advantage of these people that cannot defend themselves. And that when the prince comes in, he's an old man. 
and I feel like he's already he, he's excited that like he's finally been released from you know doing the wrong that he's been doing his whole life because he even says I think uh, the the point of I'm older now when the prince finally came than the oldest man that's in the 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 library or, or somewhere inside of the castle so he's been doing this a while a really long while mm-hmm. you know. We'd have to read more Ursula K. Le Guin, but I'd be curious to hear from people out there who have read more. We've at least read the uh, the ones who walk away from Omalas, and there's an element of that there's a power structure and there's abuse in this world. There's evil in this world. You still have a choice of, to your point, of whether you partake into it. I don't know if it's, you know, maybe this boy was taught these things, but in my opinion, he's still participating in the system of it. They, they, have, a, they have an option and to either walk away from it or partake in it in the Omala story, right? Here, this boy has an option of how he gets to choose. He can behave however he wants in this land of enchantment. And he reinforces exactly to your point, the power, the control, the abuse that he saw growing up. But it's still his choice. Uh, maybe he doesn't have the the working structures to see how to be better, right? And, and I guess that would be a good question is how would this boy know how to be better because he knows he feels bad when he does it but sometimes that you know we we reinforce what we what we see i think that he states many times that his story is boring and that he has no imagination he has no stories to draw upon to create his own story and i get kind of feeling that he has no moral compass he is adrift and that's why he does those things is to emulate the other things that he's seen that it's a take 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 world and that and I'm not defending him, but he doesn't know any better that just being good might not be innate. It just, we emulate everything else we see around us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of apply that lens across a couple of her stories. So, all right, we'll leave a playlist if you want to check out our other talks from her. What's the next one that we should read from Ursula K. Le Guin? My name's Ben Una. Appreciate you spending some time with us today. Peace. Peace. <laughs>